this is doing you no good, man. You need to stop coming here. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm <laughs> never stuck for that. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm still working through the wounds of the, I think, one Lent, you know, praying the rosary every day. Oh. What? <laughs> <laughs> That mean we're started. Welcome to Breaking Bread, where we're going to talk to Father Columba Jordan and his parents Robert and Maeve about what it was like growing up a, in a family. Because actually, believe it or not, he did actually have a family, <laughs> and uh, he didn't just drop out of outer space. And uh, so we're just going to talk about family life and about vocations and all that sort of thing. And please like and subscribe and make comments as well if you're enjoying this. Make comments if you're if you think we could do it better. Make comments. It'll help with the algorithm. It'll help build your podcast. We want this to be your podcast. So please help us by liking and subscribing and sharing with your friends as well. Um, so anyway, Father Columba Jordan, who are you and why do you look like that? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> who let you in? <laughs> uh, I am a Franciscan friar of the renewal. I'm Irish. Child of God. All that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've been in community... How long have I been? 22 years or so uh, this year. And uh, I'm a priest. I was ordained 2011. 2014. There you go. I That's a good job there. Yeah, yeah sure. my dad has no clue. <laughs> no. Oh, it's okay. It's the 11th, 11th. 11th of May in 2014. Uh, 14, the other way, 14th of May 2011. 2011. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's got a mind like a steel trap. <laughs> <laughs> Wonder, uh, wonder who else is one like that? Yeah, <laughs> the oracle has spoken. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, twenty. So ordained then, and uh, been in Ireland. Been, was in England for a wee bit over in Bradford, and I'm back now in Limerick, which is great. Great to be back in Ireland. Yeah. And you had a stint in Derry. I did indeed. Nine years in Derry it was great. Wow. Yeah, you were yeah. very close to us. We were very close to you. Uh, um, I will remember one of my first encounters with. Uh, Father Columba Jordan, I had just gotten involved with Net, and I don't know if you remember this, but we were in Navin for whatever reason, that, yeah. and we were walking down the street, and I was walking with you, and you actually wear a habit, a grey habit, that is somewhat not what the culture would be expecting uh, of anybody, but... Uh, I said to you, actually, I'm not sure if I'm ready to be seen in public with you. So take those kinds of things I repress. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it, it, too it, wounding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, and and uh, Nat is very close to the Grey Friars. There's an affinity there, and uh, I I would say like we don't know how this conversation is going to go, so we're just going to you know go for it. And and it's uh, we don't want this to be contrived, so let's just whatever stream of consciousness the f first thing that comes into my head is um before you go there sorry sorry <laughs> sorry i always interrupt um do you want to tell people about uh your latest venture called to more yeah, oh yeah yeah, yeah 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 so that's been going on since 2021 i think that's when it launched oh. so um i'm <coughs> some people if they, they get the impression it's kind of my thing i, I just provide content Okay. for call to more so i'm sort of working with them mm -hmm. and uh, they kind of have worked and developed the platform mm -hmm. um website and all that stuff and yeah it's great it's kind of a match made in heaven um i had been kind of in prayer and then through different people this whole thing of doing videos mm -hmm. actually I had, a, I had a really weird one i was just having a bit of a fun experiment with the lord and uh I in in prayer, I just sort of asked him, right, Lord, is there anything else, you know, ministry wise that uh, you want me to do? And clear as a bell, kind of like in my imagination. I've yeah, never yeah. Like, heard God's voice. Yeah. Really. No, you're Moses. That's yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it just it, it, like internally in my imagination, I just really had a strong sense of him saying video. Video? Do you mean ads? <laughs> it's like Gillette ads. Like, what's, yeah. what's this video? <laughs> so I was thinking it just fun because I love. I've always loved uh, like improv and messing around and the thought of doing funny videos and all sort of sort of thing. Uh, but then, like different people will come up and say, uh, you know, it'd be great to because I I teach scripture and different things, and it'd be great to take some of that they said and and could we you know put it on Instagram or something? So there was kind of loads of that going around, and it kept coming up in prayer. And then um, Katie and Edward from, from Call to More, they were trying to kick it off. They were looking for Irish content providers and 
they had asked me i wasn't going to be able to do it and then i was going to be able to do it and uh yeah and it's just been great it's been been a mad wild it's it's amazing it's amazing um platform and the content is fantastic and as you said do you think so yeah it's and it's amazing. irish <laughs> it's great that it's irish for for the for the irish people mm. but it's not just irish people who are watching it like people are watching it all over the world so. but it's great that we have an irish priest who can actually articulate the faith in a way that is actually the faith and it's not the you know that sounds like Irish priests can't do that, no. <laughs> but it, it's it's like they're, the the Americans are good at Hollywood. You spent some time in New York. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that has effect, but you're you're formed you're formed through the CFR very very well. But also, you have the rare ability to be able to articulate the faith in a way that people can actually relate to it, mm-hmm. and that that's uh, you know and and that's something. Uh, so I have a very good friend Emmett, and Emmett it, it was Emmett that put me on to uh, Matt Frad. Mm-hmm. I was telling him I have this problem. I don't know what to say, or I say the wrong thing, and he's like, "You should listen to Matt Pratt because he figures it out and he'll teach you what to say and whatever." So uh, that was great, and I, I listened to Matt Pratt for for a couple of years, and I still listen to Matt. He's he's absolutely fantastic. And I was talking to Emmett recently, and he says, "You know, the only thing I do now is I just listen to Father Columbo once a week in huh. Baltimore." <laughs> Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Once a week in Baltimore, and he says, and that's it, and that just gives me what I need to hear. Uh, from God in my in my spiritual life. Oh, well, yeah. praise God! Yeah, 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 it's a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, you're. Um, it's it's funny, like it's yeah, it's light, but very deep. Yeah, thank God. It's a nice. I, I, I yeah, it's sort of perfect for me. That's exactly <coughs> the stuff I love doing. Taking mm. uh, the some basic stuff that I found helpful. So for me, it's always that like, oh wow, thank you God, you've kind of taught me this recently. You put something on my heart, or I read mm. something. And then communicating that in a way that might be more palatable for people or a way that's just really easy to understand. Because I, I can't like understand things com- in a complex way. I tend to kind of crunch them up a little bit and get a simple way to understand mm-hmm. it. And then so then I just sort of try to explain it that way. But yeah, it's been a lot of fun. And it's great to see people, um, slightly strange to see people come up and who kind of know me, but I don't know them. Exactly. <laughs> You're <Yeah>. famous. <laughs> like, they have a funny smile. They have a giveaway smile. Oh, really? Yeah. About this person. So yeah. yeah. Uh, and <laughs> and you, you tend to stand out in the crowd as well. Do I? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's my eyes, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think the other nice thing about it for me is, is like, I'm not a, apologies to you and your crew, I'm not a great podcast watcher or listener at all only mm. listen to it one or two if i'm painting or something at the rare occasion i love to have the earphones in here and leave me for an hour mm. and i'll paint away but these are snack size mm-hmm. um, you're not sitting down for three course four course eight course meal you know it's <laughs> not an hour I'm Makeup. <laughs> I don't wear makeup. So you, <laughs> t- you, you take on a name whenever you you join the Grey Friars. Do you call him by Ooh. Father Columba or Columba? Now, th- now we're getting into Maeve. How do you call he's your son? Do, do you call him Father? Like even though he's your <laughs> yeah. son, or? he calls him Father <laughs> for the laugh. We have we have a greeting. Hello, Father. Hello, Hello Father. father. <laughs> <laughs> and and Dad likes to sometimes introduce when he meets people who know me. He'll introduce himself as Grandfather Columba, <laughs> uh, very good. Very good. which can confuse people sometimes. <laughs> So yeah, what do you just call me, Brian or oh, Brian. or Columba? Yeah, yeah. Just, oh, just you just told said it. All. You just told everybody what edit that. Edit. <laughs> We're, just <laughs> We're just going to do a beep. On Brian, <laughs> well, you <laughs> asked a question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, still, you still call him Brian. <laughs> well, I would, and yeah. I, so there, if we're in company, I'll call him Father Columba. Okay, very yeah. good. Yeah. 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 That sort of puts everybody. You know, at yeah. ease, yeah. 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 Who's this? Who's this Brian fellow that you're talking about? You know, uh, kind of thing. And they're wondering. It was a bit of a thing because initially, I really wanted people to call me because it, it's actually in our constitutions. Mm. Mm-hmm. It was, so we can take a name, mm. a religious name. It was an old tradition, uh, and it goes back all the way back to Jesus, right? He, like P- Simon, you meet Simon, it says you're going to be Peter, and yeah. the uh, James and John, you're the sons of thunder, mm-hmm. for some strange reason. Thomas was the twin, mm-hmm. the other one was the Zealot. Even further back to Genesis, almost. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Abraham, yeah. Mm-hmm. Abraham. Sarah. Abraham. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's class, yeah. So it's kind of a, it's a, it's a Jesus God thing, mm-hmm. Bible thing. So um, 
But then I was kind of really keen. Oh, I want, really want my, you know, back home, everyone, you know, yeah, go along with this. But I noticed because especially with kind of cousins and uncles and aunts, it's just awkward. It's like they know me, they've known me their mm-hmm. whole life. So um, I, I tried it for a while and some of my cousins were amazing. They were like, no, guys, we really need to, you know, honor him and this. And they were so good. And then after a while, I'm like, nah. <laughs> yeah. so there's like a um amnesty you know anyone who knew me before yes. they, you're, that's fine but if you don't if you didn't know me before like people who didn't know me and then they come up and they mm. call me by my baptismal yeah, name yeah. Like, mm. yeah yeah most <laughs> yeah, people right don't here. know your name no baptismal. well they do now yeah. oh thanks very much it's out sorry we can we can bleep that <laughs> yeah, out okay. that would be hilarious. um yeah <laughs> um so you guys are, uh, you're, you're, Maeve, you're from Bally Buffet and, exactly. and you have a beautiful Donegal accent. Well, if I can you. say that from one Donegal accent to another, yours is very, very nice. Melodic. Melodic. And, and you haven't lost it at all. And uh, Robert, where are you from? Uh, born and reared in Terenure in Dublin. Really? Yeah. Went okay. to school there. Uh, did primary literally just down the road, didn't even have to cross the road. And then the Terenior College, the Carmelites, for 10 years, from when I was seven. Mm-hmm. Um, great rugby school. Mm-hmm. Um, so really appreciated that education. Uh, one of the things, other things that contributed to my life in the Lord eventually was the Boy Scouts. We had a troop in the college. Uh, so our, our, our chief bottle washer was a priest, always. Uh, Father McCuig started it, Father Heaslip took over, Father Dorn was the main guy when I was a 11 to 17 year old. Mm. Um, and the Catholic Boy Scouts of Ireland, as it was then, uh, is... You were the blue shirts? You were blue shirts, yeah, exactly. Mm. I, I, I never heard it called that. Yeah. yeah, I never heard it called the blue shirts, but um, yes, there was us and them for sure. Mm. Um, we were aware of the other crowd, but we never had any interaction in scouting with them. Never. It's mad. Which it's was crazy. Mad, yeah. yeah. It's, crazy. Uh, it's interesting living in Terenure because we have uh, we have a very fine uh, synagogue in Terenure across the road from the cinema. But I heard only about 10 years ago that there's a second synagogue in Terenure, a very orthodox one behind what used to be the old Garda station. Um, so living in Terenure like that, on a main road as we did, every Saturday you'd see the Jews going to to synagogue and we all assumed they were going to the one. But um, my point is that um, these were again people we nodded at or said hello to. We didn't play with them. They didn't play with us at all. Not until I think we started, I started interacting with my Jewish and Protestant neighbours when we were doing an in- intercert. We're swapping French notes and studying together and that sort of stuff. Um, and then I ended up sitting beside one of them, Alan Nager, in accounting when we went to Ratmines College of Commerce back in the day. Mm-hmm. So that's where I started. My dad was a butcher in Kimmich just down the road. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, that's interesting. Um, <coughs> there were, so like there weren't many Jews in Donegal. Maeve? No, I didn't meet them. Yeah, yeah. So were you, you born in Donegal? Maeve? Yes. Uh, Donegal town. Okay. So there's a hospital here. Okay. Well, it functioned more as a hospital then than it yeah. does now. Yeah. yeah. But you, you were brought up in the main street in Bally Buffet. I did. Yeah. And which is interesting because that's where the net office is now, right where you were brought up. Um, right. And it, it's... Uh, Just a few doors down. Mm. Well... Not even we're right behind. We're in the okay. courtyard that yeah. that uh, is behind. Where like it would have been your back garden then, um, and it's. I find it very very interesting, and I wonder now. This is why we have the theologian here. So, is there any significance in the mother of a priest coming from the place where Net Ministries is coming from? Like, or is that just coincidence, or is it God incidence, or how do you define that? Where do you, where does that come out? It's just nice. <laughs> what are we nice. paying you for? Yeah, Why are you yeah. here? Get down. No, definitely, definitely, Tony. Yeah. <laughs> that was the prayers of my seven-year-old mammy. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, these things do happen. Sometimes you get that sort of, uh, you never know what was what's going on. We had a funny thing, like uh, one of our friaries in New York, St. Joseph's in Harlem, and it used to be some nuns had it. And, you know, they were sort of dwindling, I guess this is in the 60s or 70s. But one of them, um, 
apparently had this real word from the Lord or a strong sense in prayer. Or she Was there something that she'd had like a, a vision almost of it, seeing the place just crammed with novices? And, and there was a number, it was like 16 or 17 novices in the place. And uh, anyway, so this had somehow been recorded and passed down. Mm -hmm. After a while, they moved out and it was a different things, you know, the diocese used it, but eventually they gave it to us. And then uh, like one of the first years we had it was 17 novices. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you get this strange uh, mm -hmm. connection, like uh, it's down the years. So it, you yeah. know, stuff like that, but I, I, I don't know. It, it's yeah, it's right. like, like a, you know what's on my heart and I haven't, I, and I don't know, I need to give it time, but what's on my heart at the minute is God's promise to Abraham that he would have a, you know, descendants as many as the stars. And, but he had one son and that son he asked to sacrifice, you know, and obviously he retracted that sacrifice, but <laughs> the, that promise that he made to Abraham wasn't fulfilled in Abraham's time, you know, the descendants as many as the stars, but it was still a promise that came true nonetheless. And it's, it's, um, you know, to your, to your point about the, the mm -hmm. convent and, mm -hmm. You know, that was a random question. I just curveballed you. It's funny. I read a book, was it last year? Corey Ten Boom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was the name of the book. Hiding Place. And she had something similar uh, towards the end uh, of the book where she saw a building. Um, I think it was while she was in Auschwitz. She saw the building that was going to be the home for, for the children that she looked after. So, like... The Lord can use anything. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. The other similar incident that strikes me is Sister Faustina, Saint Faustina. She was told she'd do all this extraordinary stuff for the Lord. But she never saw a bit of it. Nothing happened mm -hmm. until long after she died. Mm -hmm. um, so look at it now. Yes. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. We have a convent in Rufo Diocese, so the Divine Mercy Convent. Oh, hi. Yeah, because yeah, I've been involved with the Divine Mercy conference i was going to say since the beginning not at the beginning in 1991 the first conference mm. i was involved with that and then i was on the committee from the second to the about december eighth year um and it's a fantastic that conference. dropped out yeah yeah I, I was listening to or read an article that um what do you call her sister breathing mckenna wrote mm. um in the irish catholic or she was being interviewed in the irish catholic anyway move on to me she was talking about Americans have constantly talked to her about what happened to Ireland, like what's gone wrong in Ireland. And she's like, Ireland is great. <laughs> Don't worry about Ireland. You know, our faith is strong in Ireland. And it, it, it's like, you know, you held the Divine Mercy Conference in your town where the, a thousand people came to that. There are many people come to the Divine Mercy Conference in Dublin. Four thousand, you know. So yeah. it's right back at you kind of thing. And yeah. it's, it's like people are still there where Ireland was internationally. The perception is that Ireland has just lost the faith yesterday. Mm -hmm. Like we, you know, we've been on the slow de decline. Depends on your perception or your read of the situation. Um, talk like we want this to be positive, and it's not naive to mm -hmm. be to remain positive. But talk about that. Like you guys are, you know, you're mm -hmm. you're around a while. Your son's a priest. Um, the the faith practice in Ireland is like that yet how do you how do you guys remain hopeful or do you remain maybe you're depressed and, can and I, you've given up the faith can i come back a bit Ma first maybe. fire away um the house that i grew up in in ali buffet main street opposite mm. the arch that used to bring mm -hmm. you down to the railway line and mm -hmm. to the football field um i'm thinking about you know places where there's been a lot of prayer and a lot of faith, and to the extent at times a dependency on you know the Lord listening and hearing and showing the path. Mm -hmm. I couldn't pass my mother. She was amazing, mm -hmm. and she had incredible faith. And she just went with it. She had a good sound head in her as well. Mm -hmm. um, when so you put the two God together, course. yes. Mm -hmm. Just, um, I'm just thinking that house could still, or whatever way it's sorted now, it's a space, but it's a space that received an awful lot of prayer. Hmm. 
I think that yeah. that question. Yeah, absolutely. Here. And following yeah. on from that, may have you ever walk into a house and you say to yourself, "This is a prayed-in place." Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. The house we, we have now in in uh, Kilcar. Kilcar is definitely the first time we walked in. Somebody's been it, praying here. Oh yeah, yeah, for a long time. One yeah. of the, one of the kickers, the shabby little cottage. Hmm. What's a kicker? Extra, something extra. It's a divine mercy prayer card stuck in, in the window frame. Mm. I was, as I said, quite heavily involved with divine mercy ministry back in the day. Um, I'm back now, I was a trustee. Now that I've reached my seniority, mm-hmm. um, you're an elder beer member, I mean, <laughs> which is which is lovely, lovely thing, kind of circle because there was a hiatus in the middle. We'll get to that, I'm sure. Um, but uh, just that we walked into that house and yeah, we did a lot of work. We could hear, both of us could hear my father's voice. We're never going to buy a house. Buy something in its sins. Interesting phrase. In its sins. In its sins. In other words, mm. a shabby little house that needed work that nobody nobody loves. Mm. And we bought just that place. No, None of the locals wanted it, and we bought it for a song, relatively speaking, which fitted just nicely with our budget. Mm-hmm. And um, perfect place. We're looking out at Schlieve League. Um, Beautiful. The one thing my beloved children tell me I'm never to sell. Mm. I can sell my home. Mm-hmm. In turn, you're... No, no, it's gone. Okay. It's gone. It's the pension. Okay. Um, but the house we now live in, uh, in, in Kildare, where, where himself was raised, and we're back there with that community, and that's nice. Um, but I can sell that in the morning, and nobody cares a hoot. I do not... I'm not allowed to sell it. That's oh. it. Which is lovely because there's lots no of way. memories there, have they? Yes, but it's it's such a love. There's roots there. Yeah. All, all my father um, uh, grew up in Carrick, okay, and my mother in M- Muckris. Mm-hmm. So all the his ten or whatever brothers and sisters were all grew up from that in area. this area. Yeah, um, and I I look over the bay and I'm looking at a a place. Where wow. yeah. granny, my, my granny grandparents, Harry. all yeah. of them yeah. came from there. Mm. Yeah. So it's it's very definitely a home place. Yeah, it's in the blood. I, I, mm. it's, I, I, this might sound morbid, right? Wouldn't be the first time. But my, my dad died four years ago, and he, long story short, he's buried in the same graveyard as my grandfather who I never met and grandmother and my great grandfather and grandmother and who knows who else is buried in that graveyard out in Cheshneel. And my mother said to me, Tony, you know, there's room in that grave for you. <laughs> and gee, thanks. I <laughs> know I didn't take it that way at all. Yes. No. I, I said, do you know what? I think that's a very kind offer. Thanks very much. I want to be buried there. Why? I didn't talk with you because I want to be buried with my people. I want to be buried with, you know, my, my family. Um, I'm from this area. I've lived abroad. I've lived in, you know, in, in Dublin. Um, I've lived in other parts of the country, but I'm from this area and I want to be buried with my people. And that is a, it's, I, I, there's no theology behind that at all. No, it's just a sense I, of, that's where my head is going. It's like, well, you know, you're not really there anymore. So yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Like know, it, it's just a sense of over. for my kids to come there and know they're from a place, mm-hmm. you know, for my grandkids to come to this place and say, this is where I'm from. This is where I'm rooted, wherever they may be in the world. And yeah. It, anyway, what would you say to that, Father Columba, theologically speaking? <laughs> Come on! <laughs> You've been stopped me. once already. <laughs> uh, what would I say to that? Yeah, it's an interesting one. It was a big thing biblically. Like you have Saint Joseph, uh, Patriarch Joseph. He had, you know, made the kids and the brothers and all swear that when they left oh, Egypt, yes. they would bring his bones and bury him. And Jacob, Jacob, Jacob wants to be buried well. back yeah. with his his wives uh, yeah. back in the Holy Land. He won't mention any of his wives. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so there is, there's something to it. Um, and also the fact of, uh, like, the body matters. Um, Monsignor Albacetti, who was, uh, I think he was actually originally Puerto Rican, 
he was very great friend of St. John Paul II and, and uh, Pope Benedict. And uh, he was big into the, 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 the not the Remers, I'm sure he was, the uh, theology of the body and different things. But he was interviewed one time and, and one of the interviewers said, you know, and, you know, the resurrection, you know, the Christian teaching on the resurrection of the body. I mean, really? And uh, he, got, he was rather overweight, to say the least, Monsignor. He goes, well, the, this, you see this thing? I usually do an Eastern European voice for him. I don't know why. You see this? I want this back, baby. <laughs> and he's like, does this look like a metaphor to you? <laughs> this is, but there's something like massive about our belief in the resurrection of the body that... Uh, and even like the Catholic tradition connected to that of relics, do you know pulling off bits of saints? I pull, pulling <laughs> yeah. off bits of saints. Sometimes, like, talking about morbid. Yeah, like, yeah. Nobody does morbid like Catholics. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. But we kind of sanctify the morbid. Uh, if you've ever been in the, um, is it the the Capuchin place in uh, in Rome? With all of these bones, it's like cra- I've never been. I've only all seen the pictures. Skulls, all yeah, the skulls, skulls and yeah. bo- like they and made the whole chapel out of human oh, bones. Yes, yes. You're crypt. Crypt. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. It's like crypt, you yeah. can go in there. Yeah. Um, it's in the just crypt, don't, isn't it? don't go in the afternoon because they're all asleep. But you know, in the morning <laughs> or the afternoon, <laughs> later afternoon. Uh, but there is something there about like no, where, where we were buried actually matters. The most important thing is that we get prayers, obviously, for mm-hmm. our soul. Mm-hmm. But um, we will rise again. You know, when the Lord comes, it's very, Paul's very clear, the church is very clear, our bodies will we'll rise be again. We'll with our souls. N- we won't be like we are now. We'll be glorified. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, in the meantime, like, this stuff really, we're not just spirits having, you know, we're, a human in- experience, yeah. as some people like to say. Dualism. Yeah, no, yeah. no, no. We're like body and soul. Mm-hmm. It's so important. Together. Yeah, and I think there's something of the reverence around what, what, how we treat our dead, how we think about them. That's part of why the church w- for a long time, and even still, encourages normal burial over cremation. Cremation's okay, you know, yeah. so long as we're not denying the resurrection of the body and denying the... Speaking of the symptom. body, and this is, again, like, do you remember when your parents gave you the sex talk? Just let's segue here. Yeah, that was it. How was that? I'm feeling the G like, force. Like, yeah, sure, yeah. How was that? Did they do it? Did they do a good job on it? Um, like, how was that? You're, you're, you're. No, I'm looking at Robert Jordan. And he looks like a, I'm he's, never stuck for that. <laughs> well, I, like I have no recollection of such a talk yeah no neither do i because it didn't happen <laughs> there you go there, there you go, go. No, yeah, that's inter- and he turned out okay yeah, 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 yeah. well no i'm a, i'm I a fire i'm a solid <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, there was a great one done at my last year in primary school there was one of the local ladies who came and and did it and i think it was a whole it was a big like parish school conversation apparently around oh, it. i remember oh, okay. a big weight lifting off my head yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's but actually it was it really well done to be honest yeah, that's um, good. That's yeah, good. and I remember the, the the conversation in the school, but it was it was so well done and just kind of normalized. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, that there really wasn't much. <gasps> yeah. It's just like, oh yeah, yeah, that was grand. Yeah, um, when it's done well, it's really good, and it's yeah. timed right. Yeah, it's timed right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, puberty is starting in your last year in in primary school. You're ready. Or mm-hmm. earlier now, it's or earlier. earlier. It's it's becoming earlier and earlier and earlier. But puberty? Yes. Oh, really? Pu- yes. Not just sexualization? No, puberty. Like and it's, is it because of sexualization or because I of some other factors? I think it's diet. I think it's diet. It's, oh. it's hormone related. Like, we, we, yeah. yeah. Definitely, it's, even from the age of nine and ten. Look, yeah. look at this. Certainly within my lifetime, I, I noticed that people are just getting taller. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm 6'2". My... Jermot six five, Joe six four, Brian six four and a half. Yeah. Um, well, I'm and six one and a half. He's six foot. Yeah, six one. You're smaller. Six, How come six, you're smaller than your father? Six you're one. You're tall too. Yeah, maybe? but Barry, mm-hmm. bless him, was six foot seven. Yeah, yeah. that compensates. Mm-hmm. Wow. <laughs> Who is Barry? So you've just mentioned a name. Yeah. Let's go there. Who's Barry? Barry is our eldest son. He died at twenty one. He got uh, basically sepsis. Um, died in twelve days. Immediately after he finished his finals in college, wow. so that gave rise to uh, twelve days in hospital that changed your life. Um, a posthumous graduation, which was an extraordinary event for me, it just still bowled over by how well Trinity College did it. Um, really gave us a day where we knew our 
not celebrities, but honoured guests. And uh, we were really cosseted for the afternoon. It was very, very nicely done. Mm. Uh, and the four of us were there. We had a front row seat. Um, you can add, if I'm missing anything else, I have. One of the things that really struck me as beautiful was when they actually handed over his, we were told to go up together and they gave us his certificate and they put it here. They didn't give it to me. They didn't give it to Maeve. They, and here it is. Yeah, I just, it was, um, how you say, just the sensitivity and the, absolute appropriateness of that gesture Respect. struck me yeah, yeah. Um, it wasn't Maeve's son it wasn't my son it was our son that was just I uh, really it struck me as yeah. maybe I'm overplaying it but as you can see it still gets he, me. Was, he is your son mm. uh, yeah. Maeve how, how, how did that affect you can you say pass you yeah can. that's okay <laughs> we can pass yeah. that um, well I, I think for a while, like I was working in hospital, you are accustomed to being in a hospital, so that part never really kind of um, caused me any stress. Or you know, like sometimes people come into hospital and never been in a hospital, and it's hard enough to get bad news, but to be in very strange surroundings would be the best. It's very hard to say. Um, I, I'm inclined to tell myself that um, the Lord took him because the world would have destroyed him. Um, I have a lot of kind of sense on that. It, it really, it was really hard to lose him. Um, but I think the world didn't manage to destroy him. And uh, when I die, it's getting closer all the time. But anyway, <laughs> he'll be there. Mm. We haven't really lost him. I mean, there's that whole process of just, the, I don't even have the words to describe it. Um, the, the, the absence, the loss, the, the fact that on this earth I'll never see him again. Mm. Thank you for sharing. Mm. Um, thank you for sharing so vulnerably. Uh, if, if I can throw tuppence in, mm. only in the last few years we were talking about this. I don't know if you were with us, but Emma certainly was, our daughter. Mm who was between the two boys. <clears throat> and Emma says, well, to be honest, Dad, we thought Mam would be the basket case after Mary died. But you were the basket case. Mammy was great. Um, which I put down to, to our work setup. I was working at home in the exciting job of an accountant. Um, Maeve was working in a hospital with her staff, uh, colleagues and those she was distractions married. distractions so she walked in on the first monday or whatever back at work and there was a staff meeting there was this there was uh, somebody in icu needed to be seen this morning there was this 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 and this uh it was all go if you like until finally she got back in the car and came home i worked from home i went up to my room i looked at mom's tax files bank files accounts no interest no meaning to that stuff there's anymore. nothing in the tank mm -hmm. and then I don't know how long I was in um, not long because we had we'd only moved into the house with my, into my mother's house because she was getting old and we'd moved in upstairs and we were converting the attic and we had the guys were coming to convert the attic um, two lovely brothers from Cavan and um, I can't remember their name now but anyway um uh, I had to ring and the day Barry died I had to ring no the, he was in hospital sorry halfway through came home one day and the lads were due in the next few days and I said excuse me lads um, 
this is going on at the moment. Our son has become very ill. He's in hospital. I don't know what the story is. Can we put this off for a week or two? And they said, uh, okay. So then the day he died, on a Sunday, they were due to start the next day. I rang again. And um, left a message. No, I didn't. I got them on the phone and I said, look, at this isn't on. So if you can put it back for a week, that'd be good. So anyway, um, we put them off for a week. No, I, Barry must have died, I informed them. So that was, wasn't a problem. They didn't show, no problem. Grand. So we said, look, if we're going to, we're taking this week just to breathe and we're going away for a week the following week. How about the following Monday? Grand. So we went away the following week and we had a lovely week with our Christian community down in Clare of which more and on, I'm sure. But um, we came, we were um, getting, Barry had died. So we were over the funeral, over the hump, if you like, of that. And um, I got a phone call on the last day in Fenor and my mother was on the phone. I was told to, came out of mass actually on her ring home. So I rang my mother and she said, your aunt has just had a stroke. She's in hospital. What are you doing now? I said, we're packing up. We're finishing off here now in the next hour or so. Whatever. She says, okay, pack up the caravan. When, you when you're ready to go, ring me again. So I did. And we rang again. And the aunt had died. Or died that day. And uh, so we got in the car and came home. Aunt hadn't. She died just when we got home. I just died when we got home here. But... Um, so we were back into the same rigmarole all over again. But, uh, so we got through all of that. Anyway, I'm, again, now I'm in the house, having gone through two funerals, both died on Sunday, both buried on Wednesday. It was an awful, yeah, but an awful pattern. Mm. And um, anyway, I started to try and work again. And finally, I, I, I got a client ringing me in a, in a sweat, as clients tend to, um, after getting this red letter from the VAT man, I think it was, blah, blah, blah. And went through it. So I said, okay, going to have to do something with that. Johnny, leave it with me, you know, whatever. And I rang the tax office. This is praise for the tax office, by the way. Rang the tax office and I said, look, at, um, are you sitting down? I said, what? I said, I said, hey, are you sitting? Would you sit down, please? Because I have something difficult to tell you. And it's going to be difficult to hear. I told them my son's just died. Two weeks later to the day, or a, one week, two weeks later to the day, my aunt died. Uh, I said, I have no interest in VAT files or accounts or anything else. And I have a ball of clients here, you know. And the lady said, oh, dear, Mr. Jordan, I'm really sorry. What happened? She got asked me, mm. you know, and she had lovely personal interaction. And she says, look, it, I'm going to put a flag on your file here and nobody will get a red letter for whom you're the accountant. Mm. Wow. Let us know when you're ready to get back into it. Mm. Isn't and I just that thought, amazing. just I met a human being in yes. the tax office. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was one of those, again, one of those moments mm -hmm. in your life. Yeah, if you're honest with them and, and straight but up I with them, just, very reasonable. God, you'd open somebody's bank figures. And normally yeah. you'd get your red biro out and you'd start ticking and you'd yeah. be at it. You know, working away. No hunger, no interest, no. Yeah. So how did, like, you know, how did you come back? How did you get your life back? Did you get your life back? Or did you, just, you know, for me, yeah, uh, very slowly. Didn't make any money to speak of. Several years. And every so often, I'd get a slap behind the ear. Like your man, NCS, I'd give you the slap behind the ear. Uh, not pointing at anybody in particular, mind you. But uh, get out here and get a job. <laughs> so, um, I did eventually. So uh, it came. It came right. But not without our struggles along the way. You know. mm. But the grieving thing we discovered was uh, I take a step forward, Maeve takes a step back. She takes three steps forward, I take 
half a step. And so what I learned to do was um, someone saying, how are you doing? And I'd say, well, right now, I'm fine. Because I once <laughs> said, we're fine, thank you. And Maeve says, you might be fine. I'm not. <laughs> um, you know, and she's quite right. Because there'd be other days she'd be grand. You'd be the, you know, so it's. It's, it's one of the, <coughs> it's one of the most difficult things on a marriage, isn't it? You know, it's, it's a very. Losing a child. Losing a child is, is a real test of. How did you guys navigate through that? Well, funny, the children are what are coming to mind now, particularly. I mean, I, I was just so busy all the time uh, in terms of work. And also, you know, we didn't have a housekeeper or anything like that. So all the, the work got done. What was your question? <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, like even on a on a marriage, you know, it's it's it can be very difficult because you're both grieving in your own way, and to you know, like even for us, and we haven't been through that, but when we're going through a difficult time together, it's like who's hurting more than who, you know, and and how do I you have a monopoly on on pain? Yeah, you, or, you or can't be as exactly, pain. yeah. Well, I suppose. Um, I would, you know, stop at times and say, actually, I'd probably say a prayer. Mm -hmm. And I would have found that my faith really came into its own when Barry died because probably, to be honest, there was nothing else. There's nothing else outside of, you know, the people at home and the loss, and then you know that you have to keep going. There's no options on this, even though your heart is broken. And I suppose I've always I kind of feel that I picked up my mother's faith because she didn't hide it. The others are not. I don't know. I'm. I was one of the younger ones, so I'm not so sure about the, you know, how um, they would perceive um, the same scenarios that I faced. But certainly for me, uh, my faith did make a difference. Um, and then, of course, you're also really busy making sure. How did you find that, Brian? Not a friend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you know. okay, before, you, before you answer that, Father Columba, Maeve, has your heart healed to some extent or is it still broken? Um, I miss Barry from time to time. Sometimes I'm sort of conscious of him. I'm not saying, saying he was there, but it's just that the, the brain has allowed me to, you know, feel, have an awareness of him. Um, and actually, one lovely thing is, since he died, which was amazing, 27. Um, we, you see, we always ask Barry to get us a parking space. And it, once in 27 years, we didn't get a parking space. And this would be, sorry, this would be going, you know, if you're going to the city, you know, where it's really, Tough to country get towns are fine, but the city is not fine when you're trying to park. Um, yeah, no, that was it. Uh, that that was the question. You've answered it very, very well. Father uh, Columba. Father Columba, over to you. How, like, how, like, how, how does one even phrase a question about sure. losing your bro? Yeah. Um, I've kind of realized, sort of after the fact, just we were very close, me and Barry. Not when we were younger. He was really, really good at chess. He just one of those brains. That, so he was an excellent chess player. One time I got to play, play one of the... Spassky. Yeah, Spassky. Boris Spassky, one of the... Um, I mean, he was beaten by him, him and 29 other guys at mm. the same game. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but he was just really, really good at it. So it, there was a lot of, uh, yeah, my older brother just completely trashing me. Hey, you want to play chess? Yeah, sure. And he just destroy you. No mercy, no. So there was kind of a lot, like when we were younger kids, that was tough. But when we kind of get into the teenage years, there was a great connection. 
um, especially as I was sort of discovering my voice and my sense of humor. So as he was going into university and studying, he'd come home on the weekends and we'd just hang out, just really quality time. So he's probably, as I look back at it now, not realizing at the time, he was probably my best real, my best friend or my most real friend, meaning the, the depth of actual communication. I, I had other great friends, but he was the one where he, particularly he was great at really sharing his heart with me. We'd go on these long walks and he would just talk about what he was struggling with. Um, not an Irish thing at the time. No, not really. Not really. And uh, it's taken me a long time to be able to get to the point where he was when he was, you know, 20, 21 in terms of his capacity to really share his heart um, and his struggles. I had kind of a conversion reversion to my childhood faith when I was 17 and uh, and he died when I was 18. So there was this for me, like this amazing experience of God praying you know doing missionary work actually i was in africa doing missionary work when he died um away with a pile of friends wow. um and uh yeah so it's one of those things where it's a bit of a kick you could see it like a kick in the face you know i just gave my life to jesus and what does he mm -hmm. do mm -hmm. takes my best friend away and my brother um but for me it was actually it was very different uh, the, the experience uh because people had said, oh, don't be surprised if you question your faith through all this. But what happened, uh, the only thing that, I, I mean, I had lots of good friends and the family were great and we talked about this stuff, but um, I was praying like daily. I was going to mass daily uh, in that, at that time. And uh, yeah, it's just like Jesus' presence in the midst of it. He didn't give me any answers, but he was with me. And I remember like that time you said we, we went on holidays, you know, we were at this place in County Clare Fenor where, you know, it's a week of prayer and friends and family. And um, I remember praying a couple of different times on that week. So it's right, you know, one week after he's died. And uh, that sense of feeling Jesus' presence and feeling Jesus mourning Barry's death. Wow. Like I have this other brother, Jesus. And he's more upset about Barry's death than I am. Like he, he would never want to cause us suffering, never want to cause us pain. Um, and I just, it wasn't that I got any answers. It was just that I, I knew I could trust him. Like, cause he's my brother. Of course I can trust him. What other option? I mean, the other option is despair. Um, yeah. So it was just this really hard experience of, um, when I really needed to, I was able, I could feel not just my own sorrow and sadness, but like Jesus' sorrow and sadness and his being with me through that. So that was probably the core of my experience that really moved me through. Plus I was, you know, then going to university and hanging out with lots of friends, you know, so I, I had a very busy, busy. active life, but um, yeah, still every now and again, you know, I have these dreams where he pops up in my dreams and uh, every time it gets a little bit more kind of explicit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, I, you know, I don't know if that's real connection with my brother, but it certainly helps my heart. Mm -hmm. um, the last one, we were in the room where we used to hang out when he would come back for the weekends and we would, we were both programmers. So we kind of program mostly gaming, but, um, and, uh, and he was sitting in the room and, uh, and then he said, yeah, I've, but he was, he, he was just sitting there waiting and he, he said, yeah, I, I, I used to have a brother. And, and it was weird because I was like conscious in the dream. And I said to him, yeah, I know you did. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm he. Um, and we kind of had actually had this moment of almost like a little conscious conversation, like connection moment with my brother, which is kind of the first time. Now, whether or not that was actually a real thing or it was just a dream, mm -hmm. um, it was actually a real blessing. And that was just, it was just a, few a few months ago. Yeah, yeah. further kind of sense of, of connection that he really he still is. He's there. He's, he's alive and kicking. He's alive. More alive than we are. And you know this better than anybody else. Like he's more alive than we are. Mm. And it is uh, like he sees, we see through a glass dimly. He sees the fullness of the light. Yeah. And he is like, was he in his faith when he died? So uh, I probably know that better than anyone because of the conversations he I shared had. with you. So um, <clears throat> I'm sure for lots of his friends or whatever else, they would have said maybe no. Mm. 
Uh, but no. I, I know, yeah, no. <laughs> I mean, where did I get that? It's, it's a dairy, isn't Don't it? Know it all, mommy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but um, like he talked to me very explicitly about his faith, and and if for him it was an absolute requirement. Um, and he would say that, like he would say every night he would lie on his bed. He was like six foot seven, so he'd, and he would just relax and kind of go through this process of just relaxing his body and then just praying. And he said because he had to because he was so stressed. He didn't handle stress very well. That might have been part of the reason that led actually to his getting this brain infection. Um, and just dealing, he, he, you know, his relationship with his girlfriend was um, was what it was. And uh, that wasn't totally easy, I think, at times. So that was one thing he was like, I totally need to pray. And his stress with with university, you know, he was on top of the class. And, uh, you know, he he was surprised when he was in hospital and he got word that he passed his finals. He was like, <gasps> He didn't believe it. I think he was like, "No, they're just being nice." <laughs> uh, yeah, he but he actually right. did. He, he I went over to the, the university and I spoke to the, your main teacher. His, his main teacher. His yeah. main teacher, and uh, I explained what was going on because he just handed in his final papers. And then he got sick. Yeah. Yeah, next and then day. He, next day he went to hospital and never stayed. But I did go and speak to the professor, who was his main professor, and I explained what had happened and where he was. And uh, he asked, well, what was the outlook looking like? He said, you know, I don't really know, but it doesn't look good. Mm. But now, in, in fairness, our, his, one of his doctors, his doctor was the registrar guy, not one of the chiefs, Registrar, I can't remember his name, but he, we spoke to him out in the corridor when it became clear what was going on, which was like a day or two in. And he said, um, what's, surely this didn't just happen on Tuesday night or Monday, whatever night. You said this to him or he said this to you? We said this to him. Mm -hmm. um, so is this going to have affected his performance? He's just gone through the hellish weekend, uh, finishing a project that he thought was due in on next week but it was due in on monday mm. this was like saturday mm -hmm. so he left a party with all his friends and came home and worked through two nights to try and have this thing delivered by four o'clock or whatever it was on, on monday and you ended up he'd correct some of the work and you'd proofread yeah, yeah, it and he had me trying to copy ledgers. copy discs that weren't properly formatted if it could go wrong it went wrong it yeah. was just horrendous and yeah. um so we explained we asked the doctors that this couldn't just have happened could it you know he was perfect up to sunday night and now he's dying and he said most unlikely um i'm a student myself still i'm only recently finished some of my exams i'll go and write you a note bring it to his professor tell them this make sure you go to that office and he he gave us and Maeve took the instructions and read running over to Trinity. I don't know why Maeve did that and not me. I can't remember the, the detail around that, but um, off you went. And he came back that he got an honours degree. So um, Praise God. Yeah, he was. I send a lovely consolation for you. Yeah, it was But he nice. didn't believe it. <laughs> he didn't believe <laughs> no, it. He didn't no, know. Yeah. Yeah. he didn't. He was quite believe. hilarious, actually. Well, at yeah. that point, he was in bed he was blind the infection went across his face he was yeah. blind in day, day and, uh, one. and he was you know high as a kite on the various drugs they were feeding him <laughs> but he was, he was yeah he was hilarious <laughs> he really was having slight hallucinations and different mm. things but, uh, mm. but is there anything you guys want to talk about barry that we haven't asked you the question that would lead you to answer in the way that you know that that's there um well i think it's just useful to say that we were immensely surprised um, over the funeral days and, and all of that uh, when, um, for example, a very good friend of mine through the Divine Mercy, Deacon Don, uh, Don worked just around the corner from Don Trinity. Don Yeah. I never met him. No. Yeah, but it, not too many Deacon Dons. Not too many Deacon Dons. Uh, anyway, uh, Don worked... Uh, at that stage in Delir Street, I think, and he used to go to Mass every day in Trinity. And he told us, oh, any day I go into Mass. The one o'clock Mass. Standing at the back of the one. church, holding the door up, all six foot seven of him, 
Mm. Barry's there every Barry's day. Really? Yeah, mm. we never knew. Oh, I and, I, and I'm delighted to hear you mm. say, I never knew he was into his faith in the way you just yeah, described. No. Thank you. 27 uh, years later. Uh, yeah, but it's... Daily Mass. Daily yeah. Mass. As mm, often yeah. as he was able and to manage it. Always. I don't know how tall your doors are here, but uh, he'd They're stand... They're not six foot seven. They're not six foot seven, no. Yeah. have to bend. Yeah. Well, he would. He didn't stand in the. He'd come into the chapel hmm. and stand in the chapel. Oh, well, no, but Trini- with his Trinity Chapel is bigger than six foot six. I can tell you. Mm. Yeah, well, he'd lean on the inside. He was I mean, just inside the door, as I was yeah. described. If you're on the outside, you're not on the inside. <laughs> yeah, and if you're going to mass, you need to be in the chapel. That's right. Not outside. Thank you, Maeve. You're on television, please. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. More than that. <laughs> A good drive for the fight, 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 fight. Uh, uh, at least we're not the only ones. <laughs> it's the reason to the clips, isn't it? <laughs> the reason they sent Mammy in to Trinity with the note about the thing was because if you want to win the fight, you want to send yeah. this lady. Yeah, <laughs> She's yeah, a finisher. Yeah. She's yes, the bulldozer. I, I grant you that. Yeah. 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 Not, I'm sure you would have done a great job. Well, I suppose too. the other reason I would have gone would be that I, like if you're standing still to be it's in, there's action required it's not it's not a passive thing this is something you you just deal with it and you do it today tomorrow is too late okay. i i hope we never have to bury a child uh, but losing my dad uh like four years it, it was just the reality of the practicals that had to be taken care of after this person is dead and you know you 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 feel like everything should be taken care of, but if somebody doesn't take care of it, it ain't going to get taken care of. And there's all this stuff that needs to be done. And just like you said, somebody got to do it and it needs to be done. Mm-hmm. It's funny. Yeah. I remember um, we were told Barry died or was about, no, he, we basically got a 24 hour um, uh, notice, if you like, because he was on life support. And we were told that X had happened and he'd had his, they do a test today, and they leave it 24 hours and they repeat the test tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And if he can't support himself twice, they turn off the machine. You know, and so the machine was doing all the work from the first day. Um, so we kind of had a bit of preparation, but at some point in the middle of all of that. And I, was, he, was he non-verbal at the stage? Oh, he was comatose. Yeah. Thursday, well, Thursday was the last day he spoke to us. Yeah, he had a died on Sunday. He had a heart attack in the middle of a procedure of some sort, and he was he was um, put into a coma. I don't know what the it doesn't bear Yeah, and, uh, and uh, I remember taking out my notebook and just writing down two things: long coffin, long grave. Oh my Six foot seven. Yeah, which yeah. was interesting. It's funny the little things his post mortem said. You know, preliminary examination, bloody average, average height. Average height. There's nothing. I mean, his feet would have been sticking out over the end of the trolley. But anyway, uh, so I didn't want average height to end up as the instruction for a coffin Mm. or a grave. Yeah, yeah. You don't want them to have to take the JCB in to dig another six inches off the end of the grave. It's horrible practical stuff. This might seem like an insensitive question, but has medical science progressed to the point where it would now cure what it was that Barry died of? Hugely, so well, it, uh, the science has improved, but the awareness has gone through the roof. Okay. When you'll pass a desk at a supermarket now that says sepsis, some leaflets on sepsis. Wow. Whereas, mm. um, it was they didn't much about it at the time. Yeah, mm. They knew that he had sepsis, but they didn't know where the infection was. And that, I think, is always going to be the, a problem. Mm-hmm. So, he had surgery to try and find a couple of exploratory surgeries. ENT guy was in there, like all sorts of stuff. Mm. He had amazing, amazing doctors and scientists from all over there. Mm. Can I can I say I think we should take a break now mm-hmm. and and come back to it if that's okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm aware that we might need to use the facilities. Uh, Great. Great, let's go again. Next question: Do you think that like you guys appear to be faithful? <laughs> It's, yeah, all we're it's all about the appearance. We're Fifty years next year. Yeah, that's yeah. Well, <laughs> actually, actually, I, I, <laughs> you I, phrase the question. I, well, I was, no, this I is what I was thinking that um, 
the first time we met you guys was in March at the discernment weekend up in Dublin. Mm-hmm. Father Columbo was speaking and we ended up sitting beside you guys. Mm. And I was really struck oh, by yeah. your faithfulness, you know, and actually your charismatic nature. And I what just does that mean by charismatic nature. Well, you're just your openness to the Holy Spirit. And mm. and I, I it really bowled me over. Actually, I was like, gosh, I wonder, is this part of the reason why you have a vocation? Because your parents are clearly faithful people. Mm. And then, OK, so that's part one of the question. And then this other question I would have is like, how does it happen? And I don't know if anybody can answer this question that one person in a family mm-hmm. has that vocation, you know, has faith even. And his sister well, doesn't I'm go not to sh- church. Yeah, well, I'm not sure about okay. Oh, OK. OK. And you're OK to talk about it. So maybe. Yeah, we'll no, just be sensitive. No, yeah. No, no, yeah. To say any more than that. More, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Enough said. Enough yeah. Said. Yeah. 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 She's a lovely she girl, and we know her fits. She couldn't talking. but be lovely. Look at the pair of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But theologically speaking, is there a thing there? Like we're, I'm looking at the theologian in the room, the qualified theologian. Yeah. yeah. Do you, Do you feel like that that that's was that a big influence on your vocation? Oh, of course. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was listening to a guy recently, and he was saying that you know if. Prayer and talking about God is abnormal and weird in your like circles, in your family, in your conversations. Uh, that's because nobody ever mentions it. If you start to mention, if you start just in your regular conversation with your friends, your family, whatever, you just start throwing in. Oh, yeah, the other day I was I was reading the Bible and blah, 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 blah. you know, it's not you're shoving it down anyone's throat. You're changing mm-hmm. the culture. Mm-hmm. You normalize it. And then after a while, your friends will be like, oh, yeah, no, I'm going to see how my friends into God and. And it, it ceases to be weird. So I think I grew up in a house because, okay, they were faithful Catholics, but then you had an experience of God. That were they made weird him after real. that? Real. <laughs> like I, I mean, no, it, I was I, it's a sincere question. I was three, so I'm like, no, they're just that's just that's my just parents. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, but what it did mean was I saw them growing growing up. I saw them, and they, I could see they meant it. This is real to them, so it was obvious to me that it, it was real. So you, it's not just box ticking. I was like, we go to mass, but it makes no sense. It's like, no, it, it made some sense. It's like, or at least I knew it made sense to them, something in their life. And then when the blanks were kind of filled in of well, what was the actual backstory, especially hearing that from my mom, like, whoa, uh, J, John Paul II, St. John Paul II, he said the biggest influence on his life, if I recall this correctly, was actually seeing his father kneeling in prayer in his bedroom when his father didn't know that he saw him and he was just walking past and he would see his dad regularly on his knees, clearly talking, meaning it. He said that was the biggest impact because it's suddenly real because this person who is so real to me, it's obviously real to them. So it's like, whoa. And I think that was a big thing. I remember as a teenager, I'd walk through, uh, walk through the dining room in the morning and mom, you'd be Sitting, she'd be in one seat, and on front of her, she had this picture of the Lord's uh, face and a little candle and the Bible on her knee. And uh, I just walked past her. But every morning, she'd be in there for however I was on right. in the computer. And uh, like, that's, that's not for nothing. That's really something. So it just, so that was, I think, some of like a, you know, they, they measure like the background radio, radioactivity in a room. It's like that, that was the background base level that I was starting from was these two people who are the most two sim- most significant people in my life they believe and they don't just keep it to themselves because we can uh, it's not just oh we've you know private faith on, in the public sphere you know but some people they have private faith in the private sphere <laughs> it's private from themselves like they're not mm-hmm. telling their kids oh jeepers don't let anyone see that you mean it it's like no do <laughs> let mm-hmm. you know let it out a little bit it doesn't have to be mental it doesn't have to be hands in the air but just you know yeah normalize it if it's normal to you normalize it let people let the culture be be influenced by scary though your faith of course it is it's risky it's 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 very interesting how you explain that because one of the things in the little communities you know
but it's one topic never mentioned on there ever. And we don't talk politics doesn't get answered mentioned in there very much, just chit chat mostly and when are we having coffee and um uh but recently I one of the guys is an actor and I was asked to uh help some give it a wee talk to a group of people and um has to do with voice and all of that sort of stuff. So this type of thing in many respects. And uh so I said, Why don't I message my actor friend? So I said, I'm asked to give a talk about this sort of stuff to a faith based group. That's as close as I got. I didn't push it beyond that. I said it's a charity, so there's not going to be any money involved. Um but um it's it's absolutely it's not a taboo quite but it's the unmentioned uh thing did he pick you up on that uh no because he's going to the states for a month okay. and he'll be back for so it's going to be it's funny it's, when um <coughs> becca crouch shout out to our aussie friend um when she was here that was one of the things i remember her saying that she struggled with being in ireland is that people don't talk openly about their faith you know and and i i kind of looked at her kind of going what are you talking about? I because didn't understand, and now I would find that, like in say in our intimate net circles, I'm open and totally free about. Well, this is what the Lord is doing in my life now, mm. and you know, and it's natural. Yeah, but there's a part of me that recoils. Then, like in your WhatsApp group, where you just speak. Well, if you met the ladies from the knitting circle in town, you might never. Discuss it, or did yeah. some you're in the golf club, yeah, or, you just or whatever you is your thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think I, I, I have think a, that could be changed. That that is and changing, and I, I and I'm personally a testament to my own fantasticness in that. No, I do. Fantasticness, I'm fantastic, <laughs> and I'm going, I'm going to tell you how fantastic I am. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but I, let's do a, let's do a break. That sounds really, yeah, yes, but that sounds really take, arrogant. I'm but what what I'm saying is there are ways to bring. Got up in conversation that are very, very subtle, depending on who it is that we're actually talking about. And I actually do think that people are actually open. And I think the biggest thing, the biggest problem, our obstacle to that is fear that we're afraid of what people are thinking. Back to the conversation last night, we're afraid are people going to reject me because I bring up this taboo subject yeah. that actually some people are going to reject me for it. Get over it. Yeah. Some people are not. And some people just want to talk about it. For example, last night, Filling my car up with petrol. Actually, I wasn't filling it. It was only half only. Anyway, <laughs> putting petrol in my car and the guy comes over and he says, that's my job to do that. I'm no, that's all right. I'll do that. And he's he's like, he's older than me, and he, but he wants to fill my car and we get to chatting and whatever. And the next thing he talks about his dying mom. And he says she had Alzheimer's and, you know, she's dead now. And he was just talking about this time of the year. We reminded him of that. And she's dead whatever number of years but he says she had alzheimer's before she died and it was like i was going into the home to visit her and it got so bad i i was i i thought to myself this is him saying i thought to myself this is doing you no good man you need to stop coming here and then the thought came into his head say a deck of the rosary so he says a deck of the rosary this is him telling me yeah I felt great. Beside and I couldn't mom. wait. About, beside his mom who had Alzheimer's, who was non-communicative. Yeah. And I couldn't wait to get back. And wow. I kept going back. That's beautiful. And I was like, good on you, bro, buddy. Enough said. Yeah. You yeah. know, enough said. Yeah, but did he did he open that conversation or did you? It was ju it was in the air. Yeah. It was in the see, air. The, it I was, think that's it different, though. Like, I, it's, it's like there's a girl in the... Sometimes it's appropriate and it's discernment. Well, and sometimes that was my next yeah, question. And sometimes like, it's it's inappropriate to bring it up. And it's inappropriate to bring it up whether where there I, I do believe that sacred space and it's inappropriate to bring it up where there are others listening. Which is a fault I sometimes fall into. But where there aren't others listening, I think people want to talk about it. Mm. Well, I have a thought about that. So in Ireland I've been thinking there's an awful lot of shame, or at least fear of shame. Hmm. And I think what you're describing, Sheena, like I, I feel that too of, you know, oh, I couldn't possibly, it would be death if I was to mention this. And it's the fear of other people, which, you know, I, I've heard other people from other countries comment about Ireland. You know, we're very tribal. 
we're 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 so close knit as our and it's all about well, what do the neighbors say there's just something about our culture that is extremely that way and it's really controlled by that for good and for ill and a lot of it i think is for ill but the only way to break free of that is the confrontation with with those then, fears with that shame and and the other thing that it makes me think of is uh, this comment i heard it was at a, a conference of a group called Communion and Liberation, and someone from the floor asks this question of the speaker. He said, you know, I, I find it hard, like, how do I bring my faith more into work? Which is kind of this scenario, how do I bring it in there? How do I talk more about my faith in work? And the, the guy's response was amazing. He says, what is this? Faith and bringing your f- faith in work, bringing your faith to work. You don't bring your faith to work. <laughs> what? <laughs> don't stop there. Uh, he, he says, you don't bring your faith to work, you bring yourself to work. And he was saying, we're, we're cutting ourselves in pieces. It's I am self. someone who believes. I'm going to, if, if it's a, I mean, if it comes up in conversation, yes, I'm, I'm not going to edit myself inappropriately. Because I think sometimes the, the shame or the fear of being shamed by my contemporaries, by the eye rolls, by the, oh, go on, man. Yeah. He's for the birds. The fear of that will stop me being myself. And I'm sure they don't want me to stop me being myself. Yeah. And you know what? After a very short time, because we get to set the, the culture around us. After a very short time, people will realize, no, that's just you. That's just you. Know, that's just Father Clumber. That's just. Mm. And I feel it too. And you would think I would not be feeling that, you know, obviously, because I walk in a room and everyone goes, oh, your man's for the birds. But um, yeah, anyway, just. There you go. And we also put that on people that they're actually thinking that you're for the birds, whereas an actual yeah. fact, we don't know what they're thinking. We have no clue. Yeah. And, and no clue. why should we care what they're thinking? Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, it's none of my business. It's it's not. I can't think Robert Jordan's thoughts or Maeve Jordan's thoughts. I don't know, I, and I shouldn't be trying to figure it out either. Yeah, well, there's be ourselves. There's two ways from our side of things. Well, my side of things. Let me put it that way. Um, that I would just poke a hole in the conversation. Mm. One is talk about my son, which is a people say, "Oh, wow, oh, he's." You've a son priest. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Oh, is he one of, the, you know, when you tell him then he's a CFR uh, and he's now in my, oh, that's those weird American guys. Well, uh, then you're in talk. Well, it's amazing how many of them are not weird, actually. How many of them are actually psychologists and psychiatrists and economists and one professional skateboarder, one ice skater, oh, the American. That's right, yeah, Olympic. Ice that's Olympic that's team. Right. Um, serious operators with lives before they became fraud who believe this stuff for real and i often challenge myself i have to say well they gosh all these studious people have spent a lifetime studying this stuff and when you spend time with friars you know it's real and it's one of the first things about the, the, the friars corporate when you go and encounter a bunch of them in the chapel is just their reverence for the place they're in, for what's in that little goldy box at the top. Um, They don't just willy-nilly walk around and talk out loud. They stop, they genuflect, they move, they whisper. Um, They take their prayer and their belief really seriously. Um, And that for me is is sometimes when when you're in one of your doubting moments, I say, well, right people i'm not being stupid here so talking about it that yeah. obviously is one the second one that i know this one is is something mave is probably more expert at is you in the course of the conversation talk about your dad whether he's recently dead or he's ill or as so many people will say oh my grandfather was still alive and mave will say what's his name what's her name i will pray for her mm, good for you Actually, I got a little yeah. gift yesterday. I went into the hairdressers here, other than Donegal, where I normally go. And um, this is in here in Kildare. Kildare. Yes, Kildare. Where am I? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it great to be around the place so much? But this lady, she was sitting beside me, um, and in the hairdresser, you kind of mind your own business. You know, there was a conversation going on there. She turned around to me and she gave me this little box. She said, uh, I met you here before, she said, 
and you said you'd pray for me. So good enough for me. But, um, she said, this is for you. And it's a tiny little box that she made herself, and it has uh, t the ten beads and the little cross. This one back to the rosary. Wow. And I'm, I'm, oh my God. And then she, I said, I do remember speaking to you, but I said, thank you. That's really, gosh, I said, I'm bowled over, mm. to be honest with you. And I said, will you write your name uh, for me? To the girl in charge, giving the pen and paper. She wrote it down, and I said, well, Father Columb will be with us tomorrow. So I'll ask him to say a prayer. So she was absolutely mm. over the moon about mm. that. But I, I, the power in that, and I would and never saying, have hey, felt. I'll pray for you. Mm. Yeah, and there was no onus. So, you see that that takes away the pressure on the person you're speaking to. That if I, you know, say, well, she obviously had a conversation with me, and there was something she was concerned about. So I didn't ask. I just said I'd pray. Mm. I I also think the power of saying God bless at the end of a conversation or a, in a, a, as a parting shot is also mm -hmm. powerful mm -hmm. and it's a habit that we get into that can can become you know automatic mm -hmm. but is also is blessing. no less powerful and it's a, it is mm -hmm. an actual blessing it normalizes like. it, it normalizes yeah. the fact mm -hmm. that there's a god there and people so, have a choice to say actually I don't believe they can repudiate that or they can accept it and it's it's there it also changes the atmosphere in the room in my it opinion does. yeah, yeah it does. and, and w what i would say so what we've asked father colomba what did your parents do that affected your vocation what would you say did you guys do anything intentional apart from praying obviously so that you created an environment where one of your kids would Be grow cold. a long beard and shave his head short answer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and I, um, I was never close to it. To say close to what? To the possibility that by you know what I mean. Mm. I I never have said, oh, I don't want one of my kids doing that. You know, you hear mm. people nowadays saying that. Mm. Uh, they said about him when he joined up. What an awful waste of money, a handsome man. Mm. I hear you're good looking. Don't tell him that he's. That's why he hides behind his beard. But anyway, um, so that definitely uh, uh, no is the answer to the question. I don't think we could have. I'm not aware of having done anything with a view with to with to a view to the no. Yeah. But as as Columbus says, it's your faith. It, it's who you are, mm. um, and it's uh, I the. Um, I suppose that it's your life story. You see, we, the Boy Scouts helped form me and going to school in a good Catholic school. Uh, and Maeve similarly went to. Were you in the Boy Scouts as well, Maeve? <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, um, but yes. from there, then we were invited by a lovely uh, young a baby priest just out of seminary in our parish. Kildare back in the day, as Columbus says, when he was two or three, I invited us to do a course called the Renewal of Faith, which was um, basically adult, the subtitle uh, Renewal of Faith, Adult Education in the Catholic Faith. And it was a 10 week thing where we learned, uh, well, we were, we read a chapter a week. What age were you at the stage? Were you married? We were three. Yeah. We had three children. Wow. Yeah. So our postman, no. Uh, he, yes, I think our postman was the our most frequent babysitter. And it's funny, the first week we moved back to... Yeah. Can we quote you on that? The first... <laughs> Father Columbo was babysat by the postman. By the postman. <laughs> this is where he received his vocation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was like two or three, as I said. So, um, but we went on this course and I... My, my language for it is we both had a conversion experience because of the question the book was about. It was built around one question. And the question, you know, it talked a lot about Jesus and every, the cha every page was peppered with uh, 
uh, scripture quotations which were separated. You know, they weren't just folded into the text. They were separated out. And um, the question was, uh, well, the preamble somewhat is that Jesus was an extraordinary guy. He was a great healer, a very charismatic speaker, a wonderful friend, great guy to be with. What a just great worldview he had and all that are so different and radical and exciting. Great. He was all of that. But do you believe Jesus, the Palestinian carpenter, was God? Yes or no? Good question. And the next bit I found was even better. It said, whichever way you answer that question, it will change your life. Hmm. And for me, it said, Robert, you're going to Mass every week, like you've always done, like your parents always did. But do you believe the Palestinian carpenter was God? I said, yes. Amen. 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 Brother, Father, Robert. Yeah. Um, Life-changing. And I remember where I was on the road in the bus when I said yes. Mm. On, uh, and uh, going to work and um, nobody looked weird. Nobody said, oh my God, what's happened to him? <laughs> Nothing. No horns. No wings, you know. Nothing. Just me in the bus with tears running down my face. And my book on my knee, and um, uh, same probably happened, maybe, but maybe not. Just doesn't strike her quite the way it struck me. But uh, we finished out the course, and all of us doing it. It was about well, not all of us, but a bunch of us doing it. Uh, the mammies and daddies, anyway, said, "This is good. We don't want to stop meeting on a Tuesday night." We all really enjoyed it. We were taught how to pray spontaneously, i.e. not the Hail Mary, not the Hail Holy Queen, not the glory be to the Father. No. What's going on today? Tell us about your day. Now put that in a prayer. So we learned to say, thank you God for bringing us here this afternoon. Thank you for Tony and Sheena and all the gear that allows us to do this. Thank you for the ordinary stuff. Mm. Uh, any chance you give us a dig out with such and such a thing going on, a mortgage payment coming up, not quite sure how that's going to go. Help. You know. Amen. I mean, amen. Yeah. That's so, and that's so, there's such a power and a freedom in that as well, that, yeah. and an intimacy with God in the, in the actual being, being real with him. Um, so I, I'm just conscious that we're under a little bit of pressure for time. I want to ask, one more question before we get into the last three questions, if that's okay. Um, what advice would you give, give to young parents who are raising a family, you know, revered parents of a priest? Okay. <laughs> what <laughs> what that's advice? You guys, by the way. <laughs> that's you guys, yeah. What, uh, what advice would you guys give to, you know, parents of young families who want to bring their kids up in faith and the dream w might be that God might give them this massive gift of, one of their kids maybe having a vocation to the religious life or the, or the priesthood or even have a happy marriage like you guys with all the struggles and all the rest that that unfolds. Any advice? I, th I think at a practical level, you know, it's not going to be all a bed of roses. Uh, there can be that, but there can also be a knowledge of, all the things that are working for you. And from my experience, um, up there, you know, at the top with all of the other really good things, is actually um, faith in God and knowing that no matter what happens, he's there. With you. Thanks, May. Robert, what advice would you give to young parents or old parents of young children, even? Not to exclude or to be ages. Um, I have a question slightly back to front. I love confession. Absolutely love confession. And in my lifetime, I have had a few remarkable visits to the confessional. Not necessarily in a confessional, but if you know what I mean. Um, real encounters with the Lord. And what I get 
have got there again and again is forgiveness. And I think if there's one secret that Maeve and I have exercised quite strongly between us is forgiveness. We've had a few humdingers in our time. Uh, and it can be the smallest thing. Mm. You know, uh, a row over, what did you leave that there for? You knew I'd be looking for that. You know, that small stuff. And you, you lose it and you just have to be able to come back and say, sorry, love. Very often, you mightn't say sorry, love, but you might say, make up tea. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Uh, and it can be as simple as, you know, somebody who didn't love you didn't offer me a cup of tea and then make it yourself. You know, you might want to say make it yourself, but that's what we do. We drink a lot of tea. <laughs> well. Very good. Very good. But I, I've, I have found that is, and it's a constant challenge because we are all so blooming sensitive get offended at the smallest thing um, and those around us get so offended so easily you know that you I get annoyed because you get offended and I have to apologize because I didn't mean to do that you, you, you're just you you're allowed vent in a marriage and unfortunately you can vent cruelly mean to so you need to apologize a lot hands up robert um um if, uh, apologizing is great it's no apologizing problem. i suppose is the is the thing it's the marriage even when you other. even when you don't know <coughs> what's caused the upset yeah, excuse me you forgiveness comes after you yeah. apologize mm -hmm. and it's not mine it's, if i apologize maybe does the forgiving mm -hmm. and that's yeah. how, uh, literally we we will often use a cup of tea as a good gesture that I think yeah that it communicates that love for yeah. and forgiveness with each other father Columba I'm, I'm just moving forward here uh like you have a lot of experience pastorally with young families what advice would you give to uh you know parents who want to bring their kids up in the faith and then possibly openness to vocations mm -hmm. and, and that type of thing yep um so well, I'm, I'm so impressed by, by parents. I think it's amazing that people make that sacrifice. Uh, it's, it's massive. You know, baby comes along, everything's changed, everything. And you have to lay your life down. It's like this inbuilt thing where, okay, I'm not great at choosing to love, but this baby will, it ups the ante. So it kind of forces me to love. I can still choose, but it's harder to choose not to love when you have a cute, beautiful little baby. Um, so I think it's it's really beautiful to see parents um, rise to the occasion and sometimes have their lives transformed by that. Um, so some things that I've seen that I would definitely encourage, I think it's beautiful to see like that expressions of faith that are right for the age of the child. Um, so children growing up in a the house culture where it is normal to talk about God, normalize the name of Jesus normalized conversation about the church that's positive and upbuilding um, share your faith i only heard my mother's testimony when i was 16 and it was the catalyst that changed my life but they had never shared the testimony maybe dad had a little bit um <laughs> he's, the, he's the getting the coming out no. <laughs> uh, he's, the, he's getting the bible out uh -oh. um so that's a big thing of normalizing praying and then, but I would say like not, not doing it too much. Sometimes I hear family, oh yeah, we've like a three-year-old and a five-year-old and we're praying the whole rosary with them every day. Like, oh my God. I'm still working through the wounds of the, I think one Lent, you know, praying the rosary every day. I, I find I, I'm only, not, like rosary is really hard to master. It's really hard in kids. They, I don't think the rosary is made for little kids, you know, unless you really do something to really make it. So I, I would be very careful about doing prayers that can that get, leave children with a positive experience of god it's not so much about what you teach them it's not so much about what they say or their prayers it's about how they feel as they're finishing has it is this like oh thank god that's over you don't ever want kids to have that experience so 
there could relate to that. <laughs> oh, yeah. It should be like, oh, wow, that was actually like your man you were sharing, you know, at the at the petrol stop. It's like, gee, it was, that was, it was just a decade. That was great. I'll do that again. Like, that's how we should be aiming. Like, what can we do? What works for Muggins and this little one and that one? And uh, yeah, I, this would be a big thing. And I what, see my parents forgiving um, each other and having great L rows and then processing through it somehow or other and and seeing them walking out their faith they're like oh, i don't know how this is going to happen but like bringing the kids into that thing not that they need to be overexposed to the troubles but let them see god's work at hand his hand at work <laughs> mm-hmm. let like if you're up against it say guys we're really up against it right now we really need to lean on god oh my gosh, let your kids in on that a little bit and at an appropriate degree so that they can see God's hand at work when they're young. It's like, God is real. I have no question in my heart that God is real. Um, I know some families, you know, where praying for healing is normal. Um, that's amazing. If, you're, if, you're, if you have that level of faith and you're comfortable with that, great, because they'll get to see Jesus do a thing mm-hmm. and you relying on him to do a thing. And he did it. He showed up. Uh, so many Does people Jesus don't still have heal people? I <laughs> well, there's a yeah, I think so. Yeah, I do. I do think so. Yeah. Well, that, well, that's good. Anything else you would add to the advice to parents? Uh, I'm going to ask Sheena next. So just I, no, first. no, that sounds good. That's yeah. What advice would you give to young um, parents or parents of young children? I should say. Yeah, it's funny. All of what you said, and and uh, like we only learned through our mistakes you know and i think don't be too hard on yourself mm-hmm. if you've you haven't done it right you know um you can always change you can always start again um but i think and i've i've said this before on on other podcasts that i feel it's really important that your your faith is not weird like you were saying but not just within your family. You have to get connected with other families who are trying to bring their kids up the same way so that it's not like, oh, our family just does this thing. Mm-hmm. You know, that there are other people out there who who are striving for the same goals. Well, we were lucky immediately after our conversion the next summer. We encountered Fenor and the community that is Fenor, which meets one week in the year, has nothing else formal going on. Uh, it does now, but only slightly. Um, and uh, so for a week of the year, we yeah. met these people. And you made friends. We oh, had yeah. Yeah, we had yeah, a yeah, prayer meeting families. every morning. Exactly, that's yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Prayer meeting in the morning, mass in the evening, nothing else in between. Bit of crack. Bit of crack. Ah, and yeah. um, football, whatever. Oh, the, oh, the oh, serious yeah. football still goes on 30 some years later. But I'm still um, waiting for a gold medal. I haven't won the gold. You never got a gold medal. No, a that's a pot of gold still eludes me. <laughs> where's number seven? We have a, one of the guys in, in our family, a large family, are very, very faithful Christians, the McCann clan. Um, Peter, the dad, is known as number seven. Very good. Yeah. It, because apparently, praise the Lord, was it, the, it was number seven in the songbook somewhere, sometime in his life. And he always says, hey, number seven, praise the Lord. Mm-hmm. So that's been good. But we used to have, we had a number of years when the kids were small, when six weeks wouldn't pass in the year, but you'd be coming to our house with your kids. And six weeks later, we'd be going somewhere, we'd be going somewhere or we'd meet up in his house. Mm. Uh, and I'm talking, we would drive to Bantry from Kildare, or we would drive to Galway or wherever. So exposing your kids to other families who whose number one priority is to bring their kids. Yeah. These kids, yeah. and yeah. Our, these loads of these guys are married now mm. to each other. To our, each other. Yes. Yeah. And, and that would be the other thing I would add is if you don't have people around you, get in, get the, in car the car and drive. Get yeah. in the car and drive. Yeah. yeah. I, I would say before we get into the last two questions, I would say for me, everything that you guys have said before, but two things, um, you know, where is the enemy getting at us in terms of pulling people away from the faith? The argument, the first of that is, the, in my opinion, the, the argument between faith and science, we need to get into that space and we don't have to be Einstein, but we actually have to educate ourselves in apologetics and know enough about that so that when the big questions come up from our kids that they can ask us and we either know the answers or we know where to go and get the answers Mm -hmm. and that we're not afraid and it's not like we make ourselves believe in this fairy tale because it makes us feel better that god exists it's like if the truth is such that 
God doesn't exist and we would be forced to believe that truth. But the truth is that God actually exists and we are following the truth that he actually exists. And we're not afraid of science and we're not afraid of that. It's not a false dichotomy in the way that the world, and that's something that can draw our kids away from away from the faith is this notion in the culture that faith and science are, are at odds with each other. And we know from experience that that's not the case. Um, and the second thing I would say is it's something, sex is another thing that, you know, has, will draw our kids away from the faith. So therefore we have to make that normal, you know, and you disagree with me, please on this. Um, you need to clarify. Yeah. What I'm, what I'm saying <laughs> is, yeah. what, what I'm saying is the language of sex is really important in the home at an age appropriate level. And that it's not something that we're actually afraid of because we do sex really well as Christians <laughs> and as Catholics. And it, it, it's something, it, it, it's something that, uh, Congratulations. yeah, thank you. You're welcome. And, and it, it's, it's something that we have to, like, we have 2000 years of practice. <laughs> Maybe. We have 2000 years of practice of built up theology. We've had a saint who has just lived and died. You mentioned him earlier, St. John Paul II who has got the philosophy of sex and the theology of the body and given it to us on the, on the silver platter mm -hmm. and we have it all and we need to it's imbibe beautiful. it. Yeah. We need to own it because this is what our kids are coming up against. Their friends are all, you know, sexually active or whatever. Our if we want, it's, it's an avenue that will take our kids away from the faith in Jesus Christ because here's this really attractive thing that I know is at odds with my faith. Mm -hmm. uh, all my friends are doing it. Therefore, I have to, mm -hmm. I, you know, I have to fit in and all that. So, so we need to own it in the home and we need to own it at an age appropriate level mm -hmm. and we need to know our stuff and we need mm -hmm. to not be afraid of it and having the conversation about it in an open, appropriate level. That's yeah. th th those are the yeah. two things I would say. I think the open conversation yeah. is, is something I really like. Even if you don't have answers, and I'd say that because some people are like, ah, oh, the thought of having to study apologetics yeah, or yeah. theology of the body might be overwhelming to some. But I would say just to be like, if a question's raised or someone's like, oh, hey, yeah, let's talk about it. And, or let's figure it out together. Yeah, let's just let's over dinner. Up. That's great. Yeah. And I, so not to be like, it's not, to, it's okay to have any conversation in the house and to know, as, as St. John Paul II said, you know, be, uh, be uh, encouraged. The truth is on your side. The truth of human sexuality, the truth of the goodness of the message of the gospel, it's real. And it's the thing that most corresponds to our humanity. And your children, when they hear the truth, it will set them free and it will resonate with their humanity. Even if they choose over and over again to rebel against that, they will know no. there was something. But we have to, I think that fearlessness is like uh, the whole thing. I'm like, oh, you don't bring your faith into to work. You bring yourself mm -hmm. into work. Bring yourself to the dinner table and talk about these things even if you don't have the answers, I, I think that's a great thing. It's like, it's okay not to have the answers, but be able to signpost and say, why don't you do some research on that? I would love to hear, you know, okay, whatever your friends are into, but also like look up JP2, the, the theology of the body, get the kids to do the research and have them come back with it. You know, so anyway. That's, yeah, that's, I totally, I'm totally with you. And we should be living it out in terms of our, our marriage should be a model for what it is that they're actually believing in. Like God first, my wife second, spouse. So in other words, for people listening, spouse second, kids third, in that order, work fourth. And if we have that priority, so if I have a choice to, to make between my work and my kids, if my kids need me, my work comes second hmm. or fourth. And then fun, plenty of fun. Anyway, Sheena, second last question. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> I, I was, I'm thinking here while we're talking and I, I, I would hate to miss this opportunity to talk about where we started ages ago about, you know, did you have the give the sex talk um, that I think it's really important that parents don't shy away from that responsibility, you know, to, to give their kids. Because back in the day, people weren't really talking about it much in the playground, but it's it's now it's ubiquitous open conversation. So um, I would really encourage parents to have that conversation with their kids. Mm. And and as you said, Robert, like age appropriate, you know, it, and it's earlier now than it, it used to be. So you, you just f and there's loads of resources out there to give, um, you know, age appropriate talk conversations. Yeah. Normalize it. Because I think that's a big thing. Killing the shame. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Shame, shame totally. yeah. is a major controller. It's, yeah. it, it's one of the major forces in our culture today, not just in Ireland, everywhere. 
And uh, we need to kill the shame. And you can do that really easily at the dinner table by normalizing yeah. sex conversation that's healthy and appropriate. Mm-hmm. Like this is an incredible, it's after the mass, it's the most sacred thing on earth. You are, are involved in creating life that will never end. It is the most beautiful, sacred thing. And we have it all on my way for a dirty weekend. So it's, you know, it's a, <laughs> what? No, I'm away for a sacred weekend of renewing my marriage covenant with my wife or whatever it is. Like, Amen. Th- change the language, you know, Absolutely. change the language. So yeah. I think 100%, yeah. totally, yeah. totally. And just like, maybe this is a little bit controversial to, to Ooh. say this. Sorry, Joe, did I push some? No, uh, sorry. Um, but like, in terms of whenever we were starting off and our kids were young and there was a whole conversation about the RSE that um, was being taught in the schools. And and there was a mindset there of like, well, we'll pull our kids out from those classes, mm. you know, because you get the note home. And, you know, if there's certain ways that it's going that we, we don't want our kids to discuss that at school. And we did do that. Um, but in hindsight, and we went to the bish to talk to him about yeah. it, to give out to him essentially to well, in, about it. In hindsight, I think that's one of the things that we would have changed that we wouldn't have pulled them out mm. because it makes them weird. Mm. Yes, right. Mm. And and it's a. I think, and I'm sorry if I'm offending people who still do that, but for us, it was better that we sat down and talked about what was mm. going to be talked about in school, so that they had a, had that conversation with us first and then they could go in and hear it from a stranger and then hear it in the playground but it wasn't taboo yeah but us pulling them away made it taboo yeah you know totally i i've heard it said parents you can't protect your children forever but you can prepare them yeah you can prepare them for life and i think that's amazing training ground Um, but we learned the hard way anyway Time yeah, I can't up. believe you actually went there and you mentioned the three-letter word, R-S-E. Anyway, anyway. <laughs> we are, uh, we're just running out of time, but we usually ask two questions at the end of each of our podcasts. And one is, do you, anybody here have a question for us? Maybe a united question. One question between the three of you. I hope you've got together, got in a huddle, no, and figured out what no, it is. And no. And if you don't, that's okay. That's okay if you don't. Father Columba, do you want to be a spokesperson for the Jordans? How are babies made? <laughs> <laughs> Let's have Joe, the do you not remember that? Do you not remember 25, t- yeah. oh no, 30 yeah, years yeah. ago? No, no. That, that conversation we never had. Sorry, I'm tapping the microphone. Yeah, yeah. Um, I had something, but I've forgotten it. No, that's okay. That's awesome. Okay. That's okay. So the, the last question we ask is just to kind of share with our viewers, what is the Lord uh, revealing to you these days or... Is there anything coming up, especially in your prayer time, or have you read something or had an experience that you'd like to share with people? Mm. Robert. No pressure. Into the mic. Now would be a good time. (laughs) Um, um, I suppose uh, Columba, well, go back a little bit to come forward if I can't. We talked about Barry and Barry's death. Barry dying really hit our prayer life on the head. I, up to that time, I had been involved in a lot of music ministry, uh, played at the Divine Mercy Conference, as I was saying earlier, for seven years, um, eight years, whatever. But we started saying the rosary, and we still do. Uh, 
car is a favorite location. We've said the rosary this morning driving here. Um, so the, the set prayers have been very good, but our more casual, casual is the wrong word, our in more informal personal prayer time got shot, shot to hell. Probably not a bad description in some senses. But um, more recently, in the last number of years now, it's picked up quite a deal. And with Columbus tutelage, we're getting more and more into paying attention listening. to listening, discerning, becoming aware of our gifts and simply just the need to share your faith in whatever you can, to pray for healing with. It's amazing. I've been, I haven't had any anybody throw their walk and stick away out on the street, but I'll often meet somebody and say, I might have said a prayer for your knee. Um, somebody I know now, I don't walk up to guys in wheelchairs and expect them to jump run away down the street. Um, but, um, so we're trying to to just express our, our gifts and our faith in small ways with people. Um, people we mightn't ordinarily. Um, but that has started to... Thank you. Things are lightening. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Yeah. May, what about you? What is God saying to you or what is happening in your life that is worthy of note in, in your own heart? Well, I suppose um, I have to give a lot of thanks to my son, Father Plumber, because he checks up on me to see how am I doing in exactly that way. And I kind of thought, you know, I am mean, it must be getting close to the time now where I'd be packing up the bag and taking off, you know. Uh, Do you mean <laughs> dying? Taking a flight. <laughs> yes, taking a flight straight up. <laughs> But um, uh, with the little conversations I have with um, Father Columba, are very good because it opens up a whole vista, a whole sense of, yes, God is for real. I know that one, but he is really real. And he... He talks, he talk. He doesn't just talk to himself. He actually has made a few uh, comments to me. Some um, things I don't understand um, that might rise, and I'm very fortunate to have somebody to say, well, can you explain that to me? So I think I've taken now a new leaf into a whole new realm of faith. And just the sheer joy and pleasure of being able to sit and listen and learn how to praise God. Mm. That's my, one of my stumbles at the moment. And I know that's not something I would have been doing much of. And if you're a prayer and you've never heard of it, it's all right, don't worry. Um, I just really would like now to respond to the Lord in as full a way as he has been generous with me. Amen. Um, yeah. Amen. That's beautiful. Thanks, Mary. Thank you, Father Columbia. In a circle. Aye. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, just arriving back in Ireland, Ireland is just really on my heart. Um, only in about, whatever, just a short while. I'm just praying for Ireland. Uh, the Lord's put kind of intercession. So praying for the country. And uh, the thing, funnily enough, that, that's particularly strong is praying that intercessors, that more people will pray for Ireland and that God will raise those up, encourage them, equip them, teach people how to pray for things, for people, and especially for this country. Um, and I just also God's love for the country. I heard a, of a, a talk. I didn't actually get to hear the talk, but I heard someone else talk about it. That uh, just about how beloved this country is to God. Uh, every country and every people are beloved. By every individual is his favorite. I believe that every country is his favorite country um, in a very real way. And uh, yeah, the, the phrase that was used in this context about Ireland was the Shulamite. The Shulamite's the, the bride in the Song of Songs, God's most beloved one. Uh, it's the feminine of Solomon. Um, and Solomon is the one who is said to have written the Song of Songs, which is kind of like this love poem between a, a bride and a bridegroom. 
uh, and that Ireland would be like the most beloved sort of a thing. I, anyway, so I've just been praying for Ireland. That's mm-hmm. really been on my heart. And to remind myself, Ireland's not a failure. As you were saying, like, it's not that, oh, the faith is completely gone. It's like, no, Ireland is as beloved to God as ever. Her, her people are, are so beloved by him. They're so gifted and graced. God has such a beautiful plan for this country. The whole nation and every member in it is to him is his beloved bride, is his Shulamite, who he would die for over and over again from the foundation of the world, and which he is, and that he is doing something extraordinary in this land, and he is raising people up. And I was praying for this, and then just yesterday, I get this random phone call from a lady, and she, so I've been praying for intercessors to be raised up. She, ra- she calls me and says, oh, yes, this is really strange, Father. I was calling you for other people, but then I really feel it's for me. And just to let you know, yeah, the Lord's been calling me to go back to more to church and to pray in front of the Blessed Sacrament for half an hour every day. I'm like, well, let me tell you, young lady. <laughs> uh, yeah, there, it was just, I, yeah, so that's just, I mean, that might seem kind of a strange one to some people, but it's really, for me, it's a massive issue. And I think it's a really beautiful thing. God's, God's doing something in that regard. So what, just to clarify what you're saying, our prayers actually make a difference. <laughs> no, like I'm, I mean that sincerely. Oh, but, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Massive. So tell, t- like, tell us about that. Uh, well, briefly, yeah, I, I'm just, I'm huge in that. I, I love interceding, praying for things. And I've just seen it over and over again that God answers prayers. Mm. He waits. God waits. He does nothing on this earth, almost nothing on this earth, except when his bride, the church, prays. And he will wait to answer prayers. He has everything lined up. He's like, I'm not doing it until my bride asks me. He, and he will pause his sovereign will until his beloved gets the text message and goes, all right, would you do that? And he does it. Like, yeah. And I've just seen that in my life so many times. Um, and I've heard so, so many stories of other people who, when they actually will ask and real prayers and, and prolonged prayers, and especially not just all oh, I want this thing or that thing, what is the Lord, what does the Lord want to do? What is that thing that he has set up? He's so ready to do. If we get to know what his heart is and we pray in conjunction with it, that's the stuff that's ready to happen. Not some other dream of mine that's got nothing to do with yeah, God's will. That's to do with rubbish. Yeah. Yeah. God's alive and active. God's yeah. alive and active in Ireland. Yeah. And I had, can I share one? Yeah, story? absolutely. So the other day I was praying for somebody and I had this little image of, uh, of a tooth, uh, a rotten tooth that was all leaning over. And then um, I didn't know what that meant. God bless their tooth. <laughs> so weird. Uh, later on that evening, I was talking to someone who actually had, and they were sharing with me that they have serious tooth problems. And they described it, and it was exactly the image, the imaginary image in my head. Now, this was a different person from the person I was actually praying for, but it was the right image. So I shared this with them. I said, and I showed them how I'd written it. I was like, and they, they read it they're like, that's exactly my issue. So we prayed about it. Nothing happened. Her tooth was still sore. I'm like, oh, okay. But uh, then the next day, she's on a mad long waiting list. The ne- it was supposed to be three years waiting list. The next day, she gets a letter that she can come in. I'm like, that's it. Like, God already had that lined up. Yeah. The thing, no doubt, was already in the post. But it's mad, the coincidences that happen when you pray. Yeah. Uh, God is alive and active, and he's, he's speaking to us in all these little ways. And that uh, we just respond with, you know, okay, that's a chance now prayer for that and see what happens what is the lord doing in your heart uh, um well i am um, i have a couple of, i was thinking of a couple of different things uh, like i suppose one of the things i'm reading at the moment is ratzinger's spirit of the liturgy and um it's that sounds really lofty but he's actually very accessible mm-hmm. his his writings and and i haven't finished it all but i love it i love the way he explains the why of the mass. Why do we kneel down? Why do we stand up? And I remember watching, there was some uh, film a couple of years ago, Joe, you might remember, and it was one of those probably inappropriate movies that the kids loved. And they were, they were, there was a guy, they were at mass and they were taking the mick out of the people standing up and sitting down kind of. T- and when I'm reading Ratzinger, I'm thinking, oh, I wish I knew, had known mm. that. So I could have explained then this is why we have the gestures as part of the liturgy. And, you know, the kneeling is um, it's it's portraying our sinfulness and our humble um, desire to be forgiven, you know, 
And then the standing is that we're resurrected people. Mm. So we will stand with the Lord. You know, there's only two little things, but I, I love what I'm learning about it. Mm. I, I love your reference to gesture because one of the things I've, I've learned through the friars is the power of our body in prayer. Mm. How we genuflect, not this mm. dip. I, I mean, old people do. I see 12 year olds dipping mm. like that. Mm. You know, Spending or footballers doing the sign of the cross, which is not really a sign of the cross. It's like, yeah. Anyway, yeah. they're doing it. I think yeah. it's great. Yeah. 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 Sorry, Tony, you were last. Um, what is the Lord doing in my life? I would say He is making me more confident and bold. Uh, you know, following on from the conversation that we had earlier, I, He's definitely doing something in my heart to not sit back. Second thing, um, you know, this morning, I don't know if I should share that, but I'm going to do it anyway. The story of my life. My kids are always afraid of what it is their dad is going to share. It's the the toilets are were blocked in the house, and I ended up rotting the sewer. So we live in a big house in the country on our own. We have a septic tank, and you it's not like you you have to fix it yourself. Mm. So I ended up rotting the sewers. Pause on that part of the story. <laughs> I have this ring on my finger that a good friend remember PJ Ross remember PJ back oh, in the day. Hi. PJ Ross didn't add 10 years ago. PJ visited with his mom and he said, when he was going, he said, I can make a ring out of a silver dollar. Uh, do you want one? And, and, and the way he sold it to me was, it has in God we trust on it. So I was like, I could do with some of that. So he gets a silver, 100 year old silver American dollar, wow. which is what this is here. And he works on it, does a thing to it, drills it molds it whatever it takes it into the ring my size and whatever so i'm wearing this ring with in god we trust now it has united states of america all over it. <laughs> it's, it's like, in small yeah exactly in small letters it has in god we trust and i you know i i wear it and i trust in god and i'm reminded of that when i when i wear it anyway i've got my plastic gloves on as i'm rotting the as i'm rotting the thing and the thing is not the block is not shifting. <laughs> so I'm rotting away and I'm adding more rods. And I'm pushing harder and I'm adding more rods. And I, I tell you, it is hard work. And I'm adding more rods and I'm pushing harder. And then I look at my hands and the plastic has worn away. <laughs> and I'm like, and it was this moment where it was like, yeah, I trust God. I trust you with my life, Lord. That doesn't mean to say I'm immune from the SH1T. <laughs> and it, it's it's like, it, it, but I still trust you anyway. And it's it's like, it's beautiful. It's this analogy for life and whatever, but the Lord still has me in the palm of his hand. He has my family in the palm of his hands. I trust him with all that. But it doesn't mean to say that I'm not going to experience this stuff. You know, the, you know, the, 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 the affluent, you know, the unsavory, the affluent, whatever, but he still loves me in the midst of all that. And it's beautiful and, I am so blessed to that he holds me in the palm of his hand mm -hmm. like a little child and I'm whatever age I am. Mm -hmm. Amen. So you didn't lose it? Then? No, I didn't lose it. It, it was like covered in, <laughs> covered in rod. <laughs> Stuff. Yeah. Hey guys, hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, please like, share and subscribe. It's free. Share with your family and friends. Enjoy.